Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Corey Pierce, and I'm the Marketing Director here at Churn Zero, and I'd like to welcome you to our webinar titled Actionable MPS, Using Net Promoter Score to Drive Improvement. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that we are recording this session. A link to the recording will be available approximately 24 hours after the webinar. Throughout the presentation, you're welcome to submit your questions via the question and answer box, and our staff will try and answer them as we go. We will also address as many questions as we can during the Q&A portion of this webinar. Now, I'm pleased to introduce to you today's presenter, Abby Hammer. Abby is the Vice President of Products at Churn Zero and is responsible for product strategy and execution. Abby also leads our customer success team who deliver customer implementation and work to drive adoption, engagement, and expansion across the Churn Zero customer success platform. And with that, I will turn it over to you, Abby, and then you can share your screen. Great. Thanks so much, Corey. Hello, everyone. Give me just a moment and I'll get my screen going here. Perfect. All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about NPS today. It's a, a favorite topic of mine. Um, as Corey said, we're going to do a deep dive today into Net Promoter Score, uh, or NPS. Now, for those of you that might be a little bit newer to NPS, uh, never fear. We're going to start at the beginning. We're going to talk briefly about what the metric is, how you can uh, administer surveys and calculate your score, how you can follow up on your results. Uh, and then for those of you that may be a little more familiar with NPS, maybe are already actively running NPS campaigns, there's going to be some content for you as well. We're going to do a deeper dive into strategies to uh, more effectively conduct your NPS, uh, tips on and best practices on who to survey and when to survey and how to survey. And, and we're going to spend a while also talking about how to, how to develop a follow-up process that really drives improvement based on your, your NPS results. So. That's a lot to talk about, so let's go ahead and dive right in. So let's start with the very basics. What is Net Promoter Score? So a little history lesson here, short one, I promise. Uh, Net Promoter Score was first developed by Fred Wright, held at Bain and & Company, and set metrics in 2003. And, and since then, it's been used heavily by companies, uh, both large and small, to assess customer satisfaction and has become an important metric for growth-driven technology businesses. Now, NPS, which is sometimes referred to as the ultimate question, is a customer satisfaction benchmark that measures how likely your customers are to recommend your business to friends, colleagues, other contacts. So you can think of this as a numerical value that indicates how loyal your customers are. Now, when you survey your customers, you present them with a very simple question. How likely is it that you would recommend your business to a friend or colleague? And then you present them with a zero to 10 scale, where zero represents not at all likely, and 10 represents extremely likely. Now, once one of your respondents selects a ranking, Many MPS surveys will also present you with the opportunity to uh, do a simple follow-up question so that you can attempt to figure out why the respondent selected the rating that they did. So in this case, we have a little text box that says, what's the most important reason for your answer to give us a little more detail. Now, your actual net promoter score is calculated by first segmenting your respondents into three categories. First is going to be promoters. These are your customers that scored either a 9 or a 10. Second is going to be your passives. These are your folks that scored either a 7 or 8. And the last but certainly not least, we have your detractors. And these are customers that scored you between 0 and 6. Now, to get your actual NPS, you're going to take the percentage of promoters, and then you're going to subtract the percentage of detractors. Now, NPS is going to fall in, in a range of either negative 100, meaning you have all detractors, or positive 100, which means you have all promoters. In a little bit, we're going to talk about what constitutes a good NPS score. That's a, a very common question. Uh, but in general, I'll start by saying a, a positive score. Anything above zero is good. Because mathematically, that means you have more promoters than you have detractors. But I want to take a second to explore these three categories of respondents in a little more detail because it's important to understand some key characteristics about them. 
So let's talk about a promoter uh, first. So I, I've read this as the anatomy of a promoter, which I like because it, it sort of implies to me what is their makeup, what is their build. So promoters are the holy grail for your business because they're business builders. And they're gonna be defined by a couple of key characteristics. So first, they're very loyal, they're enthusiastic advocates. So they love your business, they have a lot of good things to say about you, and they are willing to say those things to other people. And that last part, the, the willingness to recommend to others, is the real reason that promoters are so important. So word of mouth, uh, word of mouth is the original marketing channel, I guess we could say, uh, in this oldest form, of marketing is is also happens to be one of the most effective forms. There's some research out there, um, is specifically by uh, McKinsey Company, that anywhere between 20% and 50% of a company's revenue is driven by referrals and word of mouth. And in some industries, we see that spike as high as 80% of revenue. So as part of being loyal to your loyal to you, promoters are also going to defend you. They're going to fight for your brand. So if you end up in a situation where there's negative reviews or negative comments, they're going to come to your defense. Uh, and this is really uh, gunning towards the idea that they're willing to stake their reputation on you. So they're not just willing to say positive things. They're willing to say, I am uh, my my authority as whatever as however I use this product. I will put that on the line by saying they are great at this. And that's going to be really important when we talk about the potential damage that, per, that detractors can do in just a minute. Last thing to remember about promoters is, is they're very stable. They're unlikely to leave you at a moment's notice or for a small infraction. Uh, quite frankly, they're the ones that are even most likely to pay you more if you increase the, the price of your offering. So in short, promoters do all the things that we love in customers. They renew, they expand, they forgive, and they promote. Next, we have passives. Now, for my money, these are the trickiest of the bunch. Uh, they're the most difficult to understand, and they can be the most challenging to engage. Uh, and, and some of you who are newer to NPS might be wondering why passives are not included in the formula at all. And the short answer is because they don't really change the situation. They don't really move the needle. If you have a lot of promoters, well, that's a sign of potential growth. If you have a lot of detractors, that's a sign of potential decline. But if you have mostly passives, it isn't actually telling you too much besides that you may not be doing enough. You're not doing enough to make people into promoters. So what do we need to know about promoters then? Well, the first and potentially most important thing is that they're satisfied but not happy. And that's a really important distinction. Um, so there's there's plenty of products that I use that I'm satisfied with, ones that I use consistently, even daily, that I wouldn't consider myself a promoter of those products. So if someone actually asked me to recommend that product to someone else, at best I'd be hesitant, you know, and at worst I might give a, a wish-washy review, but it's certainly not going to be glowing. And even more to the point, if someone came along with the exact same offering that was a little bit more interesting in some way, whether it's a better price or one or two little features that I was that I was really interested in, I'd be a flight risk. I'd be easy to sway away. So that's to say that uh, passives are very much open to alternatives. So, uh, you know, detractors, we think about them being a flight risk all the time, but passives have that same quality. Um, we see that they tend to churn not as immediately as detractors, but they still do definitely re uh, represent a potential churn risk. Uh, because they're not, and this is all because they're not loyal to your brand. They, they tend to see competitive offerings as pretty much one in the same. So uh, they, you know, they're, they're, they're very easy to sway and they're particularly easy to sway by price. So this is one actionable item that I always tell people to take away from passives is that if you're changing price, you should be particularly aware of how that's going to hit passives. Since they see competitive products as you know, pretty much all the same, no little to no discernible difference, that leaves that one variable of price for them to make their decision on. So you should be particularly cognizant of that when dealing with passives. Last but not least, we have our dreaded detractors. So certainly it probably goes without saying that detractors are a really high churn risk. You know, statistically speaking, 
40 to 50% of your detractors will leave you in a, in a pretty decent time frame. Now, how quickly that happens depends somewhat on your pricing, on your pricing and subscription models, whether it's month to month or annual. So if your goal is to reduce churn, you know, raise your retention rates, uh, it's absolutely critical to focus on these detractors because these represent the people that are most likely to leave you. The other thing to note here is that they speak louder than your uh, promoters. So while passives are very meh and unlikely to give opinions in pretty much either direction, both promoters and detractors will speak uh, about your business, but detractors will speak louder. Uh, there was a very interesting survey uh, a little while ago of, a, of a, about uh, over 3,000 consumers, and 75% of them indicated that they'd be more likely to share a negative experience with their friends and colleagues, uh, while only 42% that they would be willing to, that they'd be likely to share a positive experience. And for those of you that are into psychology and your side time, like I am, there's actually some very interesting articles out there um, that look at, you know, compile results from a bunch of different studies in terms of how we as humans receive bad information versus good. And the really interesting thing coming out of those is that we sh it shows that we care more about the threat of bad things than we do about the prospect of good things. So what this all comes down to is that the negative experiences of your detractors can outweigh your promoters. And we're going to talk about how you can counteract that by leveraging your promoters in an intelligent way. But it's something to be uh, very aware of as you deal with your detractors. But perhaps the most interesting point, and to put a, a little bit of a positive spin on talking about detractors, is that they are actually most likely to be your next promoters. So the anatomy of a detractor and the anatomy of a promoter uh, actually share one common trait, and that is that they're passionate. So they want your product to work. They want to use it in a certain way. They want to get a certain value. And the difference is, is promoters are getting that value and detractors are not but they're both very committed to getting that value. Now, what's nice about that is that that gives us hopefully a clear action plan. If we can understand the themes in what is, is causing problems for our detractors, that gives us a pathway uh, for to fixing the problem and, and making sure that we keep our churn rates low and our retention rates high. All right, so let's take a second and talk about why NPS matters. So one of the reasons that NPS is so widely adopted is that it's considered a, an indicator of potential business growth. But why is it considered that? So when it's implemented correctly, NPS can have real measurable impacts across all teams in your company. One of the, the biggest sort of misconceptions I often hear around NPS is that it's the sole responsibility of your customer success teams and your customer service department, uh, you know, to, to track and care and improve NPS. And, and it's not true. Uh, you know, simply put, every single employee in a company can have an impact on a customer's experience and can ultimately benefit from the feedback that you're going to pick up from NPS. So for your C-suite, it's going to give them a, a simple metric that they can organize the company around and make a, a, a customer-centric culture around. And it provides a very clear picture of the organization, and it's a predictive picture as well. It's also useful for finance. So when you tie NPS to things like lifetime value of a customer, it can be a great indicator of uh, future growth and future potential churn. For customer success and support, of course, you know, that gives you insight into what you need to talk to customers about and who, what types of engagements you mean, they may, may need to be having with certain types of customers based on how they answer these questions. It allows you to triage issues before they become full-blown problems. Uh, for your product and engineering teams, gives you very clear product feedback. So as we're trying to figure out where are the areas that we need to improve our product and expand our product, NPS can be a great source of information. It also can be really valuable for your marketing and sales teams. A lot of the examples that I have up here on my slide relate to benefits that marketing and sales can get. So you can start to understand uh, you know, where you sit in, the, in your market and what your ideal customers look like and what messages really resonate with prospects and sales can use that information to start preparing for uh, objections you may get from prospects. Um, it really gives you insight, insight into the motivation of your prospects as well. It can inform your lead scoring. 
And then on the flip side, as you get those customers, it, marketing can then use that to create customer stories and personas, get a really clear picture of where you win. And sales gets the beautiful benefit of getting consistent referrals and references that they can use for future prospects. Now, despite all these potential great benefits, discussions on the validity and the potential pitfalls of NPS are really common. Um, so even Jason Lemkin, the, who's, you know, of Saster fame, he really admitted in a blog post on the Saster blog about being anti-NPS. So, uh, you know, he thought, and this is his quote, that it was a, a pretty dumb big company metric. He didn't like that he that it was backwards looking. He thought it wasn't really tied to upsells and churn or revenue. And he was concerned that it led to celebrations of the past or even worse, mediocrity in the mediocrity in the present. But over the years, he's been pretty vocal on multiple occasions uh, that his opinion has evolved and that he's now actually a really big fan of NPS. Um, he likes that it keeps startups really honest. In fact, he says this is his favorite feature of NPS, if you will. He likes that it does a, a good job of predicting net negative churn. He also likes that it works better than he expected, he says, uh, on a relative basis. And he encourages CEOs to share their NPS with other CEOs and figure out if yours is lower or higher than someone else's, why? Um, and he also appreciates, particularly for younger startups, that it can build confidence. If you have a good NPS score, it can build that confidence that a company needs to you know, power through some of the younger stages. And quite frankly, Jason's not alone in these opinions. Um, so the, the former CMO of Slack also said that, you know, used to refer to NPS as the North Star for everyone in the company. Um, and it, quite frankly, if you're interested in more of Jason's thoughts on NPS, I would take a look at the blog post that I've listed here on the Saster blog. Um, he, I, he also has another post called Why I Think SaaS Companies Stall Out at, at 20. 20 million ARR that I take a look at. Um, spoiler alert, he thinks the reason is low NPS, but it's a very interesting read. Now, all this being said, and clearly I've already self-admitted to being a fan of NPS, and I'm here today to talk about it. Um, you know, it, quite frankly, I like it because I like that I like simple surveys that can provide broad insight. And from that broad information, you can then go into verticals and gather specific feedback. Um, and in my experience conducting NPS across a variety of companies in my career, I found that, that most customers will take the time to take a short survey, and they might even answer a, a question or two on follow-up. But I certainly don't want to tell everyone that NPS is the only or even the definitive no questions asked best option when it comes to assessing customer satisfaction. There's certainly other options out there. Uh, two of the most common, which I have here on my slide, are CSAT, which stands for Customer Satisfaction, and CSE, which stands for Customer Effort Score. Now, we don't have time today to dive too deeply into these alternatives. We could do a whole other webinar on that. Um, but there's certainly a lot of research out there that you can look up on your own if, if either of those are interesting to you. Um, Instead, I want to I wanna really impress two main thoughts about customer success metrics in general. And the first is, is that one, the, the choice of metric is not as important as people think. So frankly, you rarely see companies succeed or fail based on the specific metric that they choose. What is important is that there is an interest in collecting, understanding, tracking, and improving customer satisfaction. So if you have a metric to focus around, then the intent is there. The actual metric itself can, can, be, can be less important. But if you're gonna obsess about something, I cannot recommend this enough. Don't obsess about what metric you use, obsess about how you follow up on the surveying that you're doing is what you want to do with whatever metric you use is you want to drive improvements. So whether you're using NPS or CSAT or anything else, that measurement is going to mean nothing unless you do something with it. So instead of, you know, pouring over what the metric is, pour over the how you're going to react to those results and how you're going to put systems in place to make sure that you can make changes based on what you learn from the metric. All right, so let's talk about some best practices. So let's get, we've talked about the why here. Let's get into some of the, the other W questions, the who, the what, the when, all that good jazz. 
So let's talk about who first. Which of your customers should you survey? Now, if you're not planning to survey all your customers, you need to make sure that you're developing a, rel a representative survey group. One, and so you need to make sure you're following thoughtful, purposeful sampling strategies to make sure that your, your group is, one, large enough to allow for statistically meaningful results. Uh, it also needs to be varied enough that it's gonna be representative of your overall customer base. And I'm gonna throw in a third thing here. It needs to be tenured enough that those customers could have, could have formed an opinion. A common mistake that I see when people execute NPS is that they send it to customers too quickly before someone's had enough time. So you need to think about how long it takes someone to get into your product and get some initial value and understanding before you start asking them about, about where they, uh, whether they would promote you or not. So let's talk about some best practices here. Now, the general theme here is represented by my, by my Oprah meme, and you're gonna see that as we list these out. So first thing I'll say is that you should survey all types of contacts, including your decision makers and your key stakeholders, particularly if they have purchase influence. Now, this may seem really, really obvious, but I, I often see companies focus on just serving their daily users, because they say, well, those are gonna be the, the ones that have you know, the product insight that we're looking for. But we need to remember that decision makers and individuals that make purchase decisions are not necessarily in that group of those daily users. And if NPS is going to be a solid predictor of your retention rates and of your potential growth, you need to be sure you're capturing feedback from those that actually, are, that actually wield your purchase power. Second, do not cherry pick or avoid surveying unhappy customers. Um, again, it seems obvious, but it's a common mistake of, oh, you know, we already know that group's not very happy. Let's not send the survey to them. Look, I, I have gotten some really negative feedback at various points through NPS. It can be hard to deal with. It can be hard to swallow, especially if you know you're gonna get it from certain customers. It just, it feels like asking to get hit in the face. But the fact is, is that input from every single type of your customer is valuable. And if you have unhappy customers, surveying them presents the opportunity to engage them about why they're unhappy and what they need to see change. And hopefully that leads to then being able to change their perspective. Repeat a, a little bit of what I said on the previous slide, make sure you're not surveying too early. Your users need a chance, your customers need a chance to experience the product uh, in order to form an opinion. Um, so if you ask them too early, it, they're, they're much more likely to just not answer, um, you know, because they're going to say, well, I, I don't feel comfortable giving any answer at this point, so I'm going to ignore the survey. So some for some of you, that means you need to wait to a, a particular tenure. Once someone's been with us for three months, then I think I can survey them. Um, for others of you, it might be uh, once they do a particular action or take a, you know, engage in a particular way that that's the signal that now they have enough experience and, and enough of a, a viewpoint to give you an opinion. But make sure you're picking the right time to begin that those surveys. Uh, next, you want to make sure that your follow-up process doesn't allow for gaming of the system. And this is particularly important if you choose to tie NPS into compensation. So if your customer success team or your support team is going to be comped on NPS, they shouldn't be the ones that are deciding who should be surveyed. And that puts them in a, in a really awkward position of fighting that instinct to shy away from unhappy customers because it's going to directly impact how they are compensated. Um, so you want to make sure that there that there someone isn't trying to make a decision between well am I honest about who I put into this survey or do I get paid? And speaking of money, uh, do not incentivize. Now there are going to be people out there that disagree with me on this, but I come down pretty firmly on the side of not incentivizing survey responses. Uh, when you incentivize, it results in two types of cost. There's the financial cost, which is Pretty straightforward, that's the actual cost of whatever you are giving, the discount, the gift, the reward, whatever it is. But there is also an even larger informational cost. And it's far more damaging, at least to me, that informational cost. And that comes in the form of inaccurate or biased data. So one, you're gonna get a lack of consideration. If someone has 
some sort of a financial motive, their objective is going to shift from, all right, I want to give feedback. I want to give meaningful feedback. And it's going to move towards, I want to give quick answers. How can I get through this as quick as possible to get my reward? You also can see some uh, what is called guilt bias creep in here. So, you know, customers who are incentivized have a tendency to provide more favor favorable answers. There's this, uh, this feeling of a, a quid pro quo. Now, this isn't necessarily a conscious reaction, but it can become intentional if it's, you know, if the, the better and better the reward gets. Um, so particularly if you're offering a really enticing incentive, that can sway those results towards more positive. So um, as you can probably tell from Oprah, uh, I'm personally a big fan of serving as many customers as you can uh, and coming up with your overall NPS score that you can use as a baseline. And then from there, you want to segment your customers on all sorts of attributes at the customer level, at the user level, uh, to understand how your NPS changes within those segments. So some customer attributes, these could be things like customer type, their tenure, uh, what product they're using if you have multiple, or what edition they're using if you have multiple. Um, their region, their industry, if you support multiple industries. Uh, also very interesting to look at this score based on who their CSM is, who their sales rep is, see if there's patterns there. You could also look at some user attributes. So this is where we might break up on role or function. So here's where if I survey everyone, I can then say, well, what is my NPS just for my daily users versus what is my NPS for my decision makers? And you can also look at usage. So even if I say, all right, these are the people that should be in my product, maybe I try to understand what my NPS is for people I consider to be my power users, my heaviest users, my most advanced users, versus those that are more um, you know, occasional users as well. All right, so let's talk about the when of sending surveys. Uh, and uh, you know, most of the time when I talk to customers, they're hoping I can give them a clean, you're gonna survey at these points and at this clip, and that's, that's gonna give you the perfect results. And the fact of the matter is, is that there isn't one schedule that fits all types of customers. Um, when you should survey is gonna be dependent on your business model, the relationship you have with your customers, the, the level of interaction that they have with your product, there's gonna be a, a couple of factors here. So to just give you some ideas, so first, uh, let's take something like Zendesk. So this SaaS product, monthly subscription, pretty self-service onboarding, uh, pretty high interaction rate with the product itself. Users are in there at a pretty good clip. So a survey that might, a survey that might make sense here is going to be, all right, 15 to 30 days after initial purchase. It's probably long enough to have some initial experiences and set up in the system. Then maybe we send out a second survey about 90 to 120 days after that first survey. So when that usage is even deepened a bit more, maybe now they're getting more into uh, um, you know, reporting functionality, things like that. And then finally, you might have an ongoing survey that every 90 days, forever after that, you're going to ask them how they feel. Now let's compare that to something like Intact, which is a, a financial uh, system that has, you know, again, it's still SaaS, but now we're looking at annual subscription. We're looking at a much higher touch onboarding because there's going to be a lot of in integrations and data imports to, uh, you know, to bring in. Uh, for, some, for a lot of users, we're probably looking at a lower interaction rate as well. You know, once your setup is done, now we're really moving into, I come in for routine reporting as opposed to, I come into this and use this every single day, all day long to do my job. So we'll note that we have some similarities here, but our, our schedule changes a bit. So that first survey, we got to wait a little bit longer. It's got to be after training, after go live, when we've actually had, had time to form opinions of the product. Uh, that second survey, we actually maybe now wait until we're coming up on the first renewal. We want to make sure we do it with enough time to react to, uh, you know, before the renewal. So if I get a detractor, I want to have enough time to try to course correct before the renewal. And then when I do my ongoing survey, I might lower my frequency here. Instead of every 90 days, maybe I ask every 180 days because the rate at which my customers are in there is just not as frequent. 
And last but certainly not least, this is, uh, you know, I'm, I'm assuming a lot of you that are on here have SaaS products yourself, but in case anyone out there has is really more an online purchase model. You know, now it really comes down to uh, surveying around the purchase and around if there are any uh, additional purchases, but also satisfaction with that initial purchase. So maybe my first goes 30 days after the purchase, and then another 90 days later, I try, I do again. Then another 90 days after that, I do a third time. And then after that, I go into much more infrequent if I don't have repeated purchases, because then it becomes less are you happy with the purchase you just made? And more, are you are you happy with the purchase that you made a while ago? Are you continuing to be satisfied with what you purchased? So some best practices on when to survey here. Um, so the first thing to say here is that you do want to establish a regular survey cycle. So customer sentiment is going to change. And quite frankly, it can change really rapidly um, in correlation to how your product itself changes, um, how your the services that you change uh, that you offer change. So that's why NPS should be a routine thing that you do. Um, you know, you if you ask once and then never again, that metric becomes very stale very quickly because that sentiment is going to change. Uh, if you survey routinely, you also get the added benefit of having a, a positive feedback loop. You stay in tune with your customers and you're continually able to you know, iterate on how you improve their experiences. So for them, it's very rewarding because it, it allows them to feel heard. That regular survey cadence allows them to feel heard. It can also, if you're staying on a regular survey cadence, it can give you the ability to provide regular management reporting and more accurately monitor trends than if you sort of, uh, you know, send it once and then only batch every once in a while. Now, as you're thinking about your survey cycle, you want to make sure you're not surveying too frequently. So uh, I have definitely seen some companies overuse NPS, abuse NPS a little bit. So uh, a common thing that I see is that they start asking NPS at every point of interaction. So NPS is not intended for transactions. It's intended to, rem to, um, to measure relationships. So asking people about whether they would recommend you right after an interaction ties that to that one interaction. So it's more, were you satisfied with that answer you just got on that support ticket versus what is your opinion of our business, the totality of your experience with us? So you wanna make sure that you're careful about when you ask so that you're not getting these uh, moment in time sentiments, but rather you're getting a broader sentiment. Uh, you want to make sure that your cadence lines up with the customer journey. So think back on that slide that I just showed. Uh, you want to make sure that as there are key critical moments in the in the customer life cycle that we're either waiting until certain ones occur because now they have opinions, but also that we're using those moments in the life cycle uh, to help ourselves. So if I survey 90 days before, 90 or 120 days before a renewal, I now have an opportunity to have a really critical piece of information coming into that renewal. So pick your moments uh, is what I'm saying, particularly within in the first year of a customer's uh, time with you. Uh, if you can, avoid batch and blast. So, uh, you know, on the, on the one hand, part of me says it would be better to do surveys than not ask at all. But these big batches are, are going to be really challenging. You know, you're going to be hitting people at all sorts of different points in the life cycle. Um, you know, so it's, it, it's going to be much harder to assess your, uh, your results. It also is going to put a lot of pressure on your follow-up process. So if your if your cadence is continuous over time, that means your results are going to be trickling in constantly. So instead of saying, "Oh my God, now we have thousands of of results to follow up on," well, it's like, "Oh, I have two today, and another two tomorrow, and one the day after that." So the practices you can put in place around follow-up, which we're going to talk about in a second, um, can be can be much more, uh, can be much stronger practices if you're not batching and blasting. Last but not least, make sure you're coordinating with other teams. I'm going to particularly say that you should make sure you talk to marketing. So uh, other teams might be doing surveying, and anytime you're not thoughtful about how often 
you're asking customers questions, any surveying. Um, it can mean you get a, a, a negative impact on your response rates across all of your surveys. So, you know, as we talk about making sure that you're aligning those surveys with important points in the customer journey, make sure you're also lining it up with other surveys they might be receiving from marketing, sales, product, anyone else. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about where to survey. So first option here is in-app. Now, big pros that come out of this. One, higher response rate. Um, two, more relevant feedback. Because think about it, if we, when we ask in-app, we are, we're hitting people when the product is top of mind because they just logged in. Uh, so they're, uh, so that it feels like a natural time to ask the question. And it also means that they're gonna be thinking about the product because they just logged in. So we typically see that companies can get anywhere from two to 10 X higher response rate when they move from uh, their surveys from email to in-app. Now, the big asterisk I will put on that is again, it depends on the clip at which your customers use your product. If the typical usage frequency is once a month, in-app might not be the best way to go. If it's daily, well then that's very interesting. Now, to be fair here, there's also some cons. So, uh, you know, being in app inherently is just gonna be more intrusive than an email. Even something simple like a slider, it now means there's something on my screen. I have to make a decision about whether I wanna interact with it. So some companies feel that it is too intrusive uh, to do inside the app. So that's something you'll have to, you know, have a discussion internally around. And again, it's only gonna work for certain segments. And that could be certain segments of entire customers, but also certain segments of users. Uh, you know, going back to our, our our recommendation that you make sure to survey your decision makers and your you know your purchasing power folks. Uh, well, if they're not logging in all the time, in-app surveys are not going to be the best way to hit them. Other option we have is certainly email. So, uh, you know, the pros here is it is less intrusive and it's less likely to be a reaction to a particular transition or workflow that just happened inside the app because it's isolated from the app, quite frankly. The downside here is that you might have lower response rates and depending on how low your response rates are, that can lead to less accurate results. So remember, we, if we're not surveying everybody, or even if we are, we need to make sure that we're getting to a certain level that, our, that we can reliably look at our results as statistically significant and meaningful and representative of our customer base. Uh, really, I, I usually end up saying that a blend of the two might be the winner. You know, you might choose a one method, one channel um, for certain segments. So, hey, my daily users, I'm definitely going to hit via in-app and my purchase, my purchase makers, I'm going to hit via email. But you can also try both. Perhaps you, you know, you send an email and you follow up with in-app or vice versa uh, to try to hit people on a variety of mediums. When you're surveying, though, do not embed NPS within other surveys. Uh, so this is a, a very common mistake that's made, and quite frankly, it's made by a lot of really big companies. I got a survey um, by Apple not long ago where they asked NPS within a much larger survey. Uh, now, the reason I suggest this is that the effectiveness of, from NPS comes from its higher response rate. It's a, it takes a couple of seconds to complete. It's not this, you know, endeavor where now I'm committing 15 minutes and I'm unclear how many more questions I may have to do. Um, so when you ask a lot of questions, that's a turnoff. You get abandonment rates. They, they skyrocket the more and more questions that you ask. So keeping it really simple can be, uh, you know, the, the keep it simple uh, method can be really great here. Few tips on increasing your response rates. So, uh, you know, we, we wanna do a couple of things here. One, I recommend sending your survey from a human, not from a, a department or a company. So, you know, it's common for people to wanna send it from support at or success at or, uh, but the, the thing is, is that just feels less personal. Everybody sort of assumes that those are not really being looked at by an actual person. Um, you know, so you, you want to send from a human. Now, if you're worried about swaying your results by sending it from a human that they have a relationship with, you can always make up a human or send it from your CEO, something like that. 
You also want to make sure that you're setting, if you're sending via email, that you're setting expectations in your subject line. Uh, you want to make sure that you're implying that it's going to be short, that you know that you're looking for feedback, but it's not going to take a ton of their time. You want to make sure that the call to action there is uh, is very clear and doesn't put anyone off. And to that point, make your call to action clear. If you are sending other content in around your NPS, uh, you know don't don't go link happy in it. Don't throw all sorts of stuff all over everywhere just to see if someone you can get someone on some other page that you're trying to promote. Keep it really really clean. Single call to action. Answer this question. Follow up with with a you know a single response if you'd like. That's it. If you do choose to do more than uh, just the straight up NPS question, or if you choose to do follow up questions, do not ask any more than two to three questions. Uh, and by the way, that two to three includes the initial question of the zero to 10 ranking. Uh, you know, statistically speaking, every question that you ask after two to three, you see a 30 to 50% reduction in response rate. So people are just going to abandon the survey. Um, you know, so if you keep it to its true form, its original form, the two question survey, uh, you know, you're going to be able to uh, keep your response rate really high. You also probably want to think about sending survey reminders. Uh, you know, so, hey, if someone hasn't answered within three days after me sending the survey, ping them again. Uh, you know, if they haven't answered in another seven days, maybe I try pinging them one more time. Uh, and we can see those response rates go up by you know, 15 to 20 percent just with a single reminder. Now, of course, you want to be thoughtful about reminders. I, I always tell my customers, think about how many times you'd want to be pinged by something. Um, you know, so, so certainly I wouldn't go past one or two reminders. Um, but, you know, the, the potential large boost of a 15 percent increased response rate you know, is, is certainly worth the risk of, of maybe annoying a, a smaller number of people who might unsubscribe. To increase your response rates, it's actually hugely beneficial to follow up with everyone who responds. Now, we're going to talk about how to do that here in just a second. But the reason increases your response rates is that customers aren't going to continue to give you feedback if they feel like it just goes into a black hole. You know, the uh, customers often go into particularly our first surveys with a company, with the idea that uh, they're doing this for themselves. All right, this is my opportunity to have my voice heard. I'm going to give this to this company and see if it results in anything. And if the definitive response back to them is that it's not acknowledged in any way, shape, or form, that doesn't encourage continued responses. And last but not least, this goes back to our when stuff here, but you got to send more than one a year. Don't batch and blast. That sentiment changes rapidly. So decide on what your cadence is going to be and be consistent on it so that as a company, you're able to predict when, when things are going to be changing. Um, but also your customers know that they have routine opportunities to engage with you around, around feedback. All right, let's get into follow up here a little bit. So. When we talk broadly about, you know, voice of the customer programs, including NPS, uh, it's very common for customers to really only put in a, a single closed loop process. And that usually focuses around this immediate response. So when someone responds to me, how do I sort of acknowledge that, uh, that I got their answer? But really, there's, there's four loops that we need to close here. Uh, you know, so not just the immediate response, but what's the corrective action, then what's the continuous improvement we do, and then ultimately what's the strategic change that all relates to that initial feedback. And if you're only doing that first loop, that immediate response, MPS can really start to feel like a perpetual game of whack-a-mole, where even if you to address all the points that came up, you know, another token, i.e. another round of surveys is just going to start the whole thing again, uh, you know, and there's going to be no fewer moles that pop up that round than did last round. So it's not going to feel like you're getting anywhere. So really where it becomes meaningful is when you move into these other three loops. Now I'll say it's really important to make sure that if you're going to, if you're not doing NPS now and you're going to start, or if you're doing it now, um, you really ideally shouldn't begin NPS without a follow-up plan in place. And that is because ideally you should be following up with everyone. Every single person that answers your survey should get a follow-up. Why? 
I mean, most of these are going to be pretty straightforward, but let's say I'm just to have them out there. One, makes your customer feel valued. That's really important. They're not going to continue to talk to you if they don't feel like you hear them. Um, it's, a, it's a great way to build some appreciation. Two opportunities are going to emerge. Uh, you know, so the, the real the real value of NPS is not the number, but rather the discussions that follow. Uh, you know, what information are you able to glean? What relationships are you able to build by doing this follow up? And uh, action can also happen. Uh, so if you get a really great response from someone, great. Now you can react to that. You can ask them for a review. You can ask them to be a reference. Uh, if you get really negative feedback, all right, now you understand what you need to what you need to follow up on, and you can fix their issues before they you know before they decide it's not worth being a customer of yours anymore. There's actually a very interesting survey of, uh, of over 800 account managers that was done by uh, Waypoint Group. And what I thought was interesting here is this is the AMs, the CSMs themselves, saying what value they got from feedback. So 70% of them said, hey, I got to meet new contacts. You know, we all, a lot of us talk about uh, penetration into a company. You know, how do I make sure that I have more than one champion, more than one POC, so that if I lose someone, I'm not, I'm not dead in the water. Great way to meet new contacts, following up on feedback. 67% uh, of them said it enhanced their customer relationships. 59% uh, said they had the opportunity to immediately resolve a problem. So they got feedback and it was it was not a, oh, well, you don't have to talk to my product team. We'll have to talk about how we do that. It was, hey, you just didn't know how to do this. Or, you know, or, or hey, that's a simple bug that we can fix. So there can be a really lovely uh, move of someone from a per detractor to a promoter by simply solving the immediate problem. And 29% th said that they also identified opportunities for upsell. So how do we want to go about following up? Well, the ideal is certainly, of course, that you will call every single one of your, your customers. And if you are high touch, no excuses. You should absolutely be calling every single one of your customers. The reality is, though, is that for many of us, we simply have too many customers. Our team, our CS team is a high velocity team, meaning we're vastly outnumbered by the number of customers that we have, that making an individualized call to each customer is just not reasonable. So the next step there is to email your customers. Now, there's certainly some, some points to be made about how do you make sure that that email doesn't feel just like a robot talking back to them. I'm going to talk about a little bit about how you can do that, some strategies there. But at the very least, that email back acknowledges the feedback that's been given. And as people re reply to those emails, it then isolates opportunities to take that extra effort to call. The other thing I'll say here is that you should segment how you approach this. So you don't need to treat every single customer exactly the same. So let's look at uh, three different customers here. My first one here, she came in as a five, so she's a detractor. Turns out she's a tier one customer. They pay us a lot. She's also a decision maker, and she's got a renewal coming up within the next 60 days. So this is like, this is all, all hands on deck. We have a problem here. We have a high value customer, the person who makes the decision, who who's, can make that decision soon, who's unhappy. So this is a perfect moment to say, yeah, this is someone I'm going to call. I'm going to have the CSM and manager call the customer together. If there's no answer, I'm going to send a personalized email, and then I'm going to follow up again with another call. It is imperative for me to connect with that customer one-to-one. -one. My second guy here, promoter coming in. The CSM says there's a really good relationship there. They're a power user. They're also an example of an ideal customer for you, so just really a win across the board. So maybe instead of a call, the first thing you do is you spin up an email that the CSM can review or customize before it goes out that, you know, thanks them for sharing their experiences, pushes them to try to create a review on G2 Crowd or Captera or wherever you're focused on reviews. And then if that person actually does that step, takes that review, then maybe the CSM calls them to do it, to do a, an additional thank you there. And last but not least, well, so this last guy came in as a seven. This is a self-service customer, more occasional user. They do have a renewal coming up in the next um, 
you know, in the next 60 days though. So again, maybe we begin with an email that can be reviewed or customized before it goes out. Um, you know, the message is really focused on what can we do to improve your score? And sometimes I really like asking, uh, what could we do to improve your score by just one point? Makes it very clear that we're asking for a, a, a very focused answer from them. And then you might also place a flag on their account that says, hey, this group might be potentially price sensitive. We have a person here who is a passive, you know, so if they were flagged to get an increase in price, perhaps you want to think about that as we come into that renewal. Uh, the other thing about follow-up is that I would cannot recommend enough that you categorize your feedback. Um, so if you want to continue to close those loops, you have to have a means of understanding understanding who gave which types of feedback, whether it was thematic feedback, specific feature feedback. So if you get in the habit of tagging your NPS results so that you can segment on them and categorize on them, um, you know, A, that gives you really great data to take to someone like the product team. Hey, we have X number of people that are asking for feature A or that have uh, problem B. Uh, but it also allows you that as you address those weak areas and improve upon them, you can now circle back with those customers. So, hey, everyone that asked about feature A, we're coming back to tell you that that's going to be in, you know, that that's coming in two weeks and I want you to get excited about it and we're going to run a webinar. So more than just, yes, I heard that you want feature A, but now we've done something and here it is and let's talk about it. So moves you forward in those loops that you're trying to close. Specifically, I want to take a moment to call out how you can leverage your promoters, because remember, these are the folks that represent the opportunity to grow your business. Now, a lot of people assume that if someone scores you a 9 or 10, they're going to uh, inherently start recommending your product or service to their friends and colleagues. That's probably not true, particularly if, you know, your product and service isn't something that people are going to socially discuss. The fact of the matter is, is that only usually around 20% of a company's promoters will actively endorse the product and service without have be given, being given instructions or a specific engagement. So give them instructions and a specific engagement. They may be predisposed to want to talk about your service, but they might not know how to do that or who to do that with. So don't leave them guessing. Mobilize them towards where you want them to share their experiences and who you want them to share their experiences with. Now I'm bringing back this same slide from earlier because all these benefits of NPS, um, you know, they do not happen just because you send out the survey. Um, they don't happen if you do just because you do great follow-up or just because you share the results with your leaders. They really only happen if you share your data with everyone. So N NPS becomes powerful in impacting churn and retention and growth when you democratize your no, Ooh, excuse me, when you democratize your data. So every single employee at your company should have the opportunity to see how customers perceive your products, uh, how their own performance uh, impacts that perception, and they should get the opportunity to have a voice in how to improve that. So that being very clear with this NPS across the entire company, that's how you spark, a one of the ways I should say, you can spark a transformation towards having a company-wide culture of customer success. And, and don't get caught up in the loop of it having to be really fancy. Uh, you know, put it in Slack, have a dashboard, do something. Just get the information out there, make it available, uh, make sure everyone knows what it is, and make sure everyone understands uh, how it is their job to try to impact it. Because it truly is something that every single person in the company, from finance and HR through development and customer success and sales and marketing, everyone can impact this. All right, so uh, number one question I get asked about NPS is what is a good net promoter score? What should I be aiming for? What are other people getting? What's a, should I, at what point should I be happy with my score? So very obvious thing here, but let's acknowledge, let's acknowledge it um, because we often forget about it when we're talking about NPS. No matter what you do as a company, you cannot please everyone. There are just going to be some passives and detractors that are just never going to come around to giving you anything higher than an eight on NPS. Uh, you know, and as a company, you need to acknowledge that and be okay with that. Uh, you know, detractors come in all sorts of varieties. Some are, you know, very pliable, 
And with a couple of tweaks, you can move them into being a happy customer. Others, for whatever reason, are just never going to come around, no matter what you do. And if you stop and think about it, a perfect NPS of 100 is actually, frankly, a pretty dangerous thing. It means you've, you'd have to somehow manage to effectively appeal to all customers, which in reality is just not possible. It's a lovely idea, but it just has no place in reality. So really, you need to focus on optimizing for those that you can, please. The other part of this, the other thing we need to acknowledge is that by itself, NPS, the score, is largely meaningless. Um, you know, so if you're just tracking the score for the sake of doing it and, and using it as a vanity metric, just stop. You're losing a lot of time and effort, quite frankly. Um, you know, it, NPS is an inherently jittery metric. You know, there's only a porous line that keeps passives from becoming passive uh, promoters or detractors. And, you know, frankly, because it's so jittery, I very commonly see customer groups spending a lot of time, you know, uh, trying to explain small movements in their NPS while their, you know, their execs freak out about those small movements in NPS. So focusing on just the score itself can lead to increased frustration and can even, quite frankly, undermine the credibility of your CS and your support teams, people who are often perceived as being quote unquote responsible for this, for this metric. Now, I do recognize that oh, many people, I'm sure many people on this call, uh, want to be able to measure their overall progress and there's a desire to compare their performance to others. So with that in mind, again, I'm gonna say that anything above zero is good. And that, that is just mathematical, mathematic reality. So uh, the formula tells us that anything more than zero means we have more promoters than detractors, which is what we want. Uh, now on, very global, broad NPS standards. Uh, you know, we'd say anything between zero and 50 is good. Anything between 50 and 70 would be considered excellent. Anything 70 or higher is world-class. But those are the broadest terms you can talk about. So if you want more specificity, which you should, you can do some research on average NPS for your industry. It's a great place to start. Um, also, if that inf if you can find it, I really love the idea of um, using your competitor score as a benchmark, because ultimately, if you're going to lose a customer, odds are you might lose them to a competitor. So understanding where your competitor stands can help you understand where you stand as well. And also, it's really, really critical to benchmark against yourself. This is the best advice I can give. Uh, you know, if you're you want to be watching your NPS over time, understanding how it evolves, hopefully improving it as you close those feedback loops and genuinely invest in the in the information that's being given to you. Um, and as you do this, I'm, I also recommend setting uh, instead of having an NPS goal that is a, a specific number. Think about a target range instead. So if you adopt a, a three to five point sort of range around your target, then you're only going to get uh, you know everyone up in arms if you go outside of that range, um, or if you see multiple periods of extreme inclines or declines. Um, and it means that the inherent jitteriness of the metric becomes less disruptive in your company if you have that range as opposed to just that one number. Okay, so we are going to get to questions very quickly, though, before we get to those, I just want to give a, a high level overview to how we do NPS inside of Churn Zero, um, just to give you a sense of what's possible with our tool and how some of those best practices that I talked about are actually reflected in our tool. So first, uh, we have very easy to configure campaigns. So you can run different campaigns for different types of customers at different times for different types of users, however you'd like to uh, set things up. And within your survey triggers, you can decide if you wanna be doing ongoing surveys or whether you want triggered surveys that are happening at specific moments in the customer life cycle. You have a lot of control over who those surveys go to, um, either to particular types of customers and or particular types of users as well. We also support multiple survey channels within our campaigns. So you can certainly do in-app surveying um, as pop-up sliders, we have a, a success panel, you know, a panel with a launch avatar that you can also use. We also support emailing. 
and you can see some of what this looks like here. So this uh, this customize. I'm sorry, I'm wrong side. Uh, so you can also customize the design of your survey a little bit. So we lock you in pretty tight so that you can't make changes that might uh, cause you to get less positive, less accurate results on your NPS. But you can do things like customize with your logo, change the product or brand you want to ask about. You can decide if you want to ask about a follow-up question and what you want to say as a thank you when someone finishes the survey. And for those of you that might be supporting customers that speak languages other than English, we support multilingual as well. Now, those multiple survey channels, um, you know, regardless of how someone answers, that information can flow into churn zero. So we see an example here of an email and then of an, as a, uh, in an in-app message, allows them to provide additional feedback and then takes them to your thank you splash page. End to end, someone could fill this out in well, quite frankly, if they didn't do any of the any of the reasoning, you could fill this out in 10 seconds or less. If you took a moment to write one to two sentences, we're talking about under a minute to fill this all out. Churn Zero then provides very in-depth reporting um, on uh, on the campaigns that you run. The first thing I'll say is not only do I, is our reporting date range controlled, but you can also ser uh, segment your reporting after the fact. So if I do a broad campaign to all of my customers and contacts, I can then, after the fact, cut on all those other attributes that might be interesting to me. You know, the, the customer tenure, the type, or the venue, or the sales rep, anything that I'm interested in, either at the customer level or at the contact level, can be retroactively uh, segmented on. I get my classic understanding of who my promoters, passives, and detractors are. I can see how that varies over time. And of course, I have all of my details uh, of the exact responses that I've been given. I can always kick these details out to, you know, to Excel or something like that to do with what I will. But Churn Zero goes one step beyond just helping you run those NPS uh, surveys to actually responding to them as well. So first way we help you with that is with proactive alerts. So let's say you wanted a CSM every single time they got a new promoter, or a new detractor, or a new passive. You wanted to let them know. So you could quickly build an alert that says, hey, every time this happens, go ahead and fire this off to the CSM, provide this information in that alert. And I can send that alert in a variety of different ways, uh, email, text, Slack within the product. We then also support um, uh, in what, what I'm going to refer to as intelligent automation here. Now, one of the biggest things that pe people say that people fight against sending email is that it sounds canned. So while you could certainly, if you are pressed on being able to respond, you could just do an automated email, goes out with any human ever touching it. You can also do things that require review. So in my example here, okay, I have a template that I begin with, but then when the CSM reviews this, they go, oh, okay, I know this particular person. I know we recently talked about feature X and you know, I wanna make sure that they know I already shared that feedback with my team. So I'm gonna go ahead and adjust some of this text here and then I'm gonna fire off my email. And you can even develop flows in how you respond to these, uh, to the to feedback that you get. Um, so that if you want to respond multiple times, or if you need escalation processes based on how someone responds, you can. So maybe you first send an email, and if they don't respond to that email, you send another one. If they don't respond to that, perhaps you uh, have a task for the CSM to call that customer. Uh, if they still don't answer that call, then maybe it flips to the manager. So depending on how you want to react to these scenarios, you can build out all of those. And then you can also use NPS in your customer health. So there's lots of factors that you might look at in customer health, uh, you know, quantitative and qualitative. NPS should certainly be in the mix. If we're saying it's a potential indicator of churn, um, definitely something we'd want to look at in health scoring and make sure that it's a, a healthy amount of our overall score. Okay, so with that, um, I'll go ahead and open up the, um, open up things to questions. Uh, so give me just one second, everyone. So hopefully everybody can still hear me. Um, so let's go ahead and figure out what questions we might have for you. 
Yes, yeah, so thank you for that presentation, Abby. We've had a lot of questions come in. Um, the first question we have is, is NPS limited to the company as a whole, or can it be used for more specific feedback on a product or something else? Uh, so it depends on how you set up your NPS campaign. Uh, so my customers that have uh, either multiple products, you might do different campaigns, for example. So to certain customers, I'm gonna ask how they feel about product A versus product B. Um, you do wanna make sure that you're asking for specific information. So if you want to understand how they feel about product A versus product B, you should be asking for those specific names in the question, as opposed to saying, how do you feel about my company overall? Um, so you could certainly do that, and then you could always think about those scores combined if you wanna get a sense of where everything stands for the entire company. Great. Um, another question we have is, what about a comment box in the survey? Would that be recommended or not recommended? Yeah, so um, I recommend it, provided your survey is set up the right way. Because remember, it's all about get, keeping that response rate high so that we have good data. Um, what a lot of NPS surveys do, including churn zeros, is that they don't actually show that follow-up question box until a ranking has been picked. So when someone hits it, it looks like one question. I have very little to do here. This is going to be one click. And then if they, it, and then they see that box and it provides an opportunity for them to elaborate. But if they don't, we've captured that initial impression. Um, I do think you should be following up in some capacity. I am actually a fan of going uh, pretty broad with your, with your follow-up. So what is the most important reason for your answer? Because again, remember, this is about the relationship. Um, you know, oftentimes we assume people's problems are only going to be around the product itself or, you know, they don't like our support hours or something like that. It could be much broader. Their problem could be with your pricing model or, you know, it could be with uh, how much services they're allowed to purchase or all, any number of things. So don't bound them in or push them towards certain types of answers. A, a text box allows you to be a little bit broader there. Great, I think that makes sense. Um, another question we have is at what stage of an organization, example, number of customers, mm -hmm. should you start surveying your customers? Um, you know, I, I think when if you have only a handful, it might feel a little strange. At that point, you assume you have a strong enough relationship with your customers that you know. But that's actually the fact that I use the word assume there is a problem. The intention of NPS is that it's not your assumption, it's not your perception of the customer's relationship with you and their satisfaction, it's their opportunity to tell you. Um, so I, I'm gonna say that I don't think there's a point at which uh, the, you, that it's too soon to survey. You know, certainly um, if you have a smaller base, you know, it's you might use the results differently than if you have a larger base, um, but it's always interesting to have that information. Okay, another question we have is, do you survey all point of contacts at a, of, at a customer or just one person? How do you handle different scores from different people within the same customer organization? Great question. So my recommendation is that you go broad. Uh, certainly go broad and survey everyone. You know, we want to make sure that we're hitting not only our frequent users of the product, but our less frequent users of the product and perhaps people who don't use it at all, particularly if those people are uh, decision makers and ha and hold the wheel the purchasing power there. Um, so what I like about it is go broad and then once you have your answers, segment after the fact. It certainly is very important to be able to say, okay, uh, my NPS for my power users is a 32, but then when I look at my decision makers, that drops down to 15. Now they're both still positive, so that's good, but there is a difference between those and we can start to isolate why there's a difference. Um, but that begins by surveying everybody. Uh, so I would go to more than just your one POC. Okay. Uh, and I think we have time for just one last question. Um, what do, do you think that NPS should be tied to compensation in any way, or is that putting too much stake in it? You know, that's a really, really interesting question. Um, I, I think the right answer is a bit uh, organization to organization dependent. And the first thing I'll say is, is if you're not following NPS best practices, you know, huge grain of, uh, of salt that you should take with putting it into compensation because you want to make sure that you're not uh, setting, setting your employees up for failure. Um, if you're running it consistently in the right way you and you're feeling confident about that, that's where you can then um, talk about it. Now, where I 
sometimes am cautious around uh, putting it into compensation is, is that typically it only goes into compensation for just the customer success and or support teams. And what we've talked about a lot today is that NPS can be influenced by every single team. So if you're gonna comp, I almost like the idea more of saying this is a company metric. So as a company, we're comped on this, whether that's some sort of bonus, if you meet a certain, if you stay within a certain threshold for the entire company. But I, I would encourage you to, uh, however you treat compensation, to remember that this isn't just about customer success and customer support. It is broader than that and to treat it as such. Great, um, I think that will wrap up our presentation today. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us. And when you close out this webinar, you will see a brief attendee survey pop up and we'd appreciate your feedback there just so we can continue our webinar program and uh, provide more content that you're looking for. So thanks again, everyone for joining us and have a good rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.